I've entitled our session, Why Are We Here? So my session this morning is a question, actually. And then I'm going ahead and giving away the answer. So I'm just going to let you know right on the front end what the question is, what the answer is, and then you can't possibly get lost after that. But why are we here? We are here to know him. That's what I'm going to suggest. And in 1 Peter, the third chapter, and the 15th verse, I'm just putting myself on the line a little bit here. But Peter said, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Isn't that beautiful? So this morning, I'm kind of really putting myself on the line with you. I said when I began teaching the scriptures that I needed to be able to establish what I'm saying to you from a good heart and with good sound reasoning so that you can understand what I'm saying, and that's incumbent upon me. I have an obligation to do that. So there is a hope that lies within me, me personally, and I want to be ready to be able to give to you and to anyone else an answer as to how and why that hope lies within me and what this means to me. So why are we here and what is the point of everything we're doing? Have you ever really just stopped yourself and, and wondered about that or asked yourself that question? Why do we have this teaching? I'm teaching this morning by the grace of God. Why are we seeking to learn? What's that all about? Why are we gathering together? Why do we do this? Why are we here this morning? Why? What's the business of our receiving water baptism, our receiving spirit? Why are we praying? Why are we, if we do indeed suffer, why do we suffer as Christians? Well, I want to suggest to you that these matters are not ends in themselves. And sometimes I think we get confused about that. We kind of get ourselves going in a bit of a circle with these different things. And after a while, it's all about those things themselves. So our teaching becomes about the teaching and our learning can become about learning because we like to learn things. We gather together and we become about us. We've figured it all out and we have a plan and we have our system and we do this and we do that and we know how to do all of these things. But then if we're not careful, it becomes about all of that. And first thing you know, it's all turning out to be very hollow. Pleasant, nice, but hollow. So it's really not about the prayers themselves in a sense. It's what we're seeking through those prayers. It's really not about the teaching in a sense. It is what's on the other side of that teaching, on the other side of that learning. And we're gathering together for purpose. We're gathering together that we might be edified and we might edify one another. And we might glorify the God who has brought us. These things are not ends in themselves. And I think that's so important for us to recognize. But what I want to talk about today is what is that end that we're really seeking through all of these things. What's it about? And in so doing, as we talk about this, I want to set before you the heart of the gospel that I preach for your consideration. And I think that I owe that to you, and I frequently feel this way because I realize that the gospel I'm preaching, it does differ in some very important ways from what may be typical or common. But I've come to this gospel I am going to declare to you today not because I was coerced or pressed or pushed or trying to match anybody's thoughts or any organization's program. It's just because I just love the Lord. And I remember just walking out one time years ago and saying, Lord, I'm really, really, really tired of religion. I'm tired of serving the church instead of you because if you've ever been there, you know what I mean. After a while, it's all about the church and it's all about serving the church. And we lose sight that there's really supposed to be a God on the other end of this. But this is the heart, the center today of the gospel I preach. And I set it before you for your consideration. And then you may decide. So let's begin. Let's begin with just some facts that I think we all know. But let's remind ourselves 
Man was created for fellowship with God. We need to keep that in mind. God indeed enjoyed all of his creation, and as he created various aspects of his creation, he, he would say, and that was good. He enjoyed this. He saw that it was good. But when he made mankind, he made mankind for a higher purpose, something more precious to himself, and that was a fellowship at a different level from the rest of his creation, an interaction with himself at a different level, a, a creature that indeed could interact with him and could appreciate the things that he had done in ways that the rest of the creation could not. And then we have this problem that Adam broke that fellowship by his disobedience. And what I believe was a privilege of life, God did not owe it to mankind that he would live on and on and on. But to mankind he gave an unending life, but the privilege that God extended to humanity was taken away because of disobedience. And then death entered through that disobedience upon all men. Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. This is a, an incredible story that, that Paul is relating, and he goes into a lot of elaboration at that point. But this much is clear. Sin came into the world through one man. And that left us with this circumstance. The problem was twofold. First of all, it was a problem as it related to us. We had lost our place with God, a place of honor. And we also now, we died. But that's only half of the story because God also lost what he sought. He lost that good, clean, clear fellowship that he had had with us, his creation. So now the virtual reason that we were created has been broken. But you'll notice that God did not just then say, okay, enough of this. He didn't just clear the board and, and do away with humanity. I think he could have. He had other plans in mind. And that will bring us closer to this gospel that I'm proclaiming to you today. After these problems developed, we're now faced with circumstances that we ourselves as humanity could not resolve. The law could not resolve the problem that we faced. In Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 21, Paul brings this thought to us. He says, is the law then opposed to the promises of God? He's been talking about the law. He says, certainly not. Notice this next statement. If a law had been given that could make a lie, then righteousness would indeed come through the law. There was a disconnect. There was not a law given that could bring life. And by that he means an unending life, an eternal life. What was the problem? Paul is going to elaborate on that as well. It wasn't really the law that was the problem. It was us again. In Romans, the seventh chapter, verse 14, Paul says, For we know that the law is spiritual, and, and this was of God, and this was a good thing. He said, But we have an issue here. I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I am weak. We are, after all, the children of the guy who goofed up to begin with. If you will, drop back to verse 11. Let's look at his context a little larger here. He says, here's the deal. He's talking about the law. He said, and that was, the law was wonderful. But he said, for sin, seizing an opportunity in the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. Guess what? As the law entered the picture, as it did through Moses, it brought actually wonderful things and good things. But it also did something else. It demonstrated our weakness again. We now have more ways to goof up than before the law was actually given. I think when God established a wonderful and good law, that wasn't going to solve this problem because we were still weak in this flesh. My question before you then is, what could we as humanity then do to make amends? I think we're stuck. I think we have a problem that we can't resolve. Well, that brings us to the next thought. 
The only way this matter could be worked out then is somehow or another, God would have to work it out, and it couldn't be on the principle of law because we're going to mess up on that. But God did make a plan. He had it in mind from the very beginning. And it was a plan that would work for Him and for us. It had to be a plan where He could remain righteous and still somehow this work out for us. That is to say, He had a law. He could have just said, you know what, I don't care whether you keep it or not. He could have compromised on the principle of righteousness and in doing so, diminished his own self and diminished his own righteousness. He couldn't do that. He couldn't live with himself, if you will. I mean, seriously. Because sin had to matter. It mattered to him. How does he resolve this problem? Well, let's follow Paul's explanations. In Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 17... If because of the one man's trespass, who was the one man who trespassed? Adam. Death then exercised dominion through that one. Death rose. It didn't just rule over Adam. Death rose and ruled over Adam and all his descendants. Much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness. Notice this. Where did that come from? What are you talking about, this free gift of righteousness? The free gift of righteousness exercised dominion in life through who? Through something. There's something else going on here, isn't there? Through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all... So one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. Verse 19, For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Isn't this amazing? We've got a circumstance where that God is doing something most extraordinary. It was the decision of God when Adam disobeyed and dishonored God. It was the decision of God that he would bring death then upon humanity. God decided because of what one man did, now death enters. And actually that's Paul's point in the long parenthetical phrase that came just before the passage we're reading at the moment. Because of what one man did, death entered. And God is the one who made that choice. He could have just decided, well, only Adam will die. No, because of what one man did, God decided all will die. All that are in Adam. Verse 20 then, and the law came in, so we know that came later. But the law came in with the result that the trespass really went away and got better. No, the trespass multiplied. If I have only one commandment to break, and that's what Adam had. Brother Mark talked about that the other day. He had only one commandment to keep, and he broke it. <laughs> Give me ten, and now I've got ten opportunities to mess up, don't I? Give me a hundred laws, and now I've got a hundred opportunities to mess up. It's not that the laws were bad, though. They're good, but I'm weak. This is the catch. That's why the law could not work out to bring life. Yeah, that was the problem. Otherwise, righteousness would have come by the law. And there would have been no need for another plan. But law came in with the result that the trespass multiplied, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. In the heart of God, God was working. He's going to bring forth a plan that's wonderful. So that just as sin exercised dominion in death, so grace might also exercise dominion through justification, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and now He announces him three ways. He's Jesus. He is the Christ. What does that mean? We've talked about that. It had a meaning, didn't it? It wasn't just his last name or something. (laughs) As we've noted before, it wasn't wasn't Joseph and Mary Christ. Christ had a meaning, and the meaning was one who's been anointed. We're going to look at that in just a moment and see how that came about. Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we're going to see how this matter of him being our Lord came about also. The third chapter of Romans, verse 20, Paul says, For no human being will be justified in his sight, that is, in the sight of God, by deeds prescribed by the law. Well, we've been understanding that. 
For through the law comes the knowledge of sin, so this is good. But we've already learned that knowledge of sin actually only increases the sharpness of our departure and our weakness. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets. And it was. They reasoned about Jesus out of the law and the prophets that had told of Him. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. What we're doing here is we're getting a look into the mind and the heart of God. God who despised evil. But there's another sense of something going on in God. God could look at humanity and there's something else that He could love. There's something else that could endear humanity to Him in such an extraordinary way that it could shake the whole world, so to speak, and change this whole issue of our relationship with God. What was it? This righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Know this about faith. God loves faith. He looks upon people. I think he loves faith because it's really a rare commodity. It's hard for him to come by. But God loves faith and this faith is so valuable and so important to him that it rises up before him and it pleases him. But here's the rest of the story. God's ultimate plan to work these problems out for us didn't involve just some nebulous faith, some any faith, some kind of faith, some strange, we don't know, whatever kind of faith. It was faith in his plan. And his plan involved this Jesus that he anointed, Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for all who believe, for there is no distinction. He means here between Jews and Gentiles. It doesn't matter who you are. Since all have sinned, that is both Jews and Gentiles, we hear this and we think of it in in an individual sense. Every person has sinned. That's true. But actually his context is slightly different from that. His context is among the Jews, among the Gentiles, it doesn't matter. All people, all kinds of people, those that have the law, those that didn't have the law, everybody sinned. Since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, verse 24, they are now justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in, here it is again, Christ Jesus, the anointed Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by His blood, effective through faith. He did this to show His righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the sins previously committed It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous. Here's our verse. And that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Think about this. God has shown us, verse 26, that he, God, could be righteous, hold to his righteousness, and yet justify people through something that he valued so highly and that is faith, in something else he valued so highly, and that was Jesus. I love this next verse then. In verse 27, he says, Then what becomes a boasting? Under this program that God is working out, nobody's going to boast because God knows all have sinned, all have fallen short of the glory. Nobody has a right to be boasting here, period. Instead, what are we going to find? That boasting is excluded by what law? By the works of the law? No, no, that that law wouldn't exclude it. But here's what it did it. By the law of faith. The principles of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. But let's ask ourselves this question then. Why are these issues, and particularly this faith in Jesus that he's talking about, Why is it of such value to God? In other words, of enough value to God that God would look at the matter and say, this is great enough to me. Somebody who's going to have faith in this one. That's so important and so valuable to me. All of their sins will be remitted. All their sins will be forgotten. That's how valuable this is to me. Here's why I think it was the case. By one man 
Sin entered into the world by one man's disobedience. Sin entered the world. And God loved that man. God loved Adam. He made him. But by one man's obedience, now God is allowing righteousness to come. And just as surely as it was by the providence of God that he would determine that in Adam people would die, whether they had sinned after the similitude of Adam or not, he talks about that a little earlier, then the same God by his own decision could say, and you know what? Those who will be in Christ, those who will be his, I've decided they will live by one man. Sin enters. By one man, life enters. But why is this man so important? I mean, how could this be? This man really was God's son. And notice what I said. This man was God's son. And let's think about it for just a moment. Luke, the first chapter, verse 35. I know you're familiar with these verses, but think about them again. The angel said to her, that is Mary, then the angel comes to her and tells her she's going to have a son. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, because the Holy Spirit and the power of God will come upon you, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. Mary's son was the Son of God. Do we realize then that Jesus Christ was indeed a new creation of God out of the love of God. And indeed, it's because the Spirit of God came upon Mary and caused her to bring and to bear this son. That's God's work. That's God's son. Notice, again, is a part of the gospel that I preach. Mary's son was the son of God. If not, then Mary's son had no father. Bear on that for a moment. But here's the deal. What's going to come upon Mary? Not a pre-existent God, the Son that's going to come upon Mary. Therefore, this is going to be the Son of God. No, the power of God is going to come upon Mary. The power of the Most High is going to come upon her. It is the Spirit of God that's going to overshadow her and come over her because the Spirit of God causes her to conceive. That Son of hers, that Son that's born of hers, will be called the Son of God. And yes, Mary's son had a father. The man, Christ Jesus, had a father. And his father was God Almighty. That's why the man, Christ Jesus, is the Son of God. Nowhere in the Scriptures is the picture provided that a preexistent God the Son overshadowed Mary and came on her. It's the power of God that came upon her and caused her to conceive. This man, Christ Jesus, is the Son of God. And God loves him. He's unique and he's wonderful. He is the only second time in all creation that God brought forth a son of his own creation. The first time, man was formed, remember, out of the dust of the earth. And it's God that breathed into him the breath of life. And man became a living soul. That man, who was his father? God was. In Luke, when he gives the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you'll notice he goes all the way back, and he was the son of this one, and the son of that one, and that one was the son of that one. And he gets all the way back to Adam, and he says, who? Adam, who was the son of God. Adam was the son of God. Meaning, God really was his father in a very direct sense. Well, now God has created another. This time, this son is created in this wonderful woman, Mary. And that child born of her is indeed the Son of God. Look in Luke then, the second chapter, verse 52. And I love the way that, uh, that Luke phrases this. He says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature. He was growing up. Remember, this is just after the, the events that uh, Pastor Mark talked about recently when he went to the temple and he was left behind as they went on back to home and, and so on. And then they went back and found him and he was in and so on. After that, we get the summary statement by Luke. And Luke says, and Jesus increased in wisdom. I want you to notice that. He was not born having some extraordinary wisdom unlike other human beings. God blessed him with wisdom. 
God gave him wisdom. In fact, God gave to him wisdom and understanding more mightily than any who had come before him. He increased in wisdom and stature. And he increased, what? In favor with God and man. God is looking at Jesus, his son, and he's looking as he did in, in creation in the beginning and saying he was well pleased. He's looking at his son and saying, this is good. And as Jesus is growing up, God is looking and saying, this is great. This is wonderful. This is my son. He's proud of him. What do you think? As a father would be. Then in Matthew 17 and 5, that comes through yet again. And notice what Matthew says. This is when they were on the mount that we call the Mount of Transfiguration. And remember, Peter was speaking, and they, it was wonderful, and he said, Oh, Lord, let's stay here, and we're going to put a, up a tent for, for Moses, and we're going to put up a tent for Elijah and all this, and it's going to be great, and we're going to spend time. And we're going to Remember, while those words were still in his mouth, there came a bright cloud over them on that mountain of transfiguration. A voice said, This is my son. Hear him. This is my son. I'm well pleased with him. You listen to him. That's the reason we get this picture in, in the beginning of the book of Hebrews where it said, you know, God who in, in various ways and at various times in the past had spoken unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. And all the mysteries that God had in mind, everything God had in mind from the beginning, God vested those things in his son Jesus. And this is tremendous. So God loved his son wonderfully. God loved other men. God loved David. He's a man after my own heart, he said. How many of you know that, that God loved Abraham? He did. He's, he was called the friend of God. Wow. But God loved his son Jesus. And God had a plan that through this man, righteousness would come to many. And I might mention there what Paul said in Romans, the fifth chapter. By one man, sin entered into the world and death because of sin. He says also by one man, one man's act of righteousness, one man's act of obedience, life is entered. I want you to notice something that seemed very important to me in that and as I've thought about it over the years. It's man who had sinned, folks. Not God. But it wasn't God who sinned. It was man. It was not an angel that sinned. So it wasn't an angel that could make restitution or bring us to God. It wasn't an angel. It was man, us. It wasn't, as some have thought, an angel man. No, it wasn't angel men that sinned. And it wasn't a God man that sinned, a God man. No, it wasn't God men that sinned. It was men that sinned. It had to be a restitution from us to God. So it was not to be an angel that would redeem us. God's plan was that it was not to be an angel. It was not to be a God. It was not to be a God-man. It was not to be an angel-man. It was to be one of us. He said, yes, but God created him. Well, God entirely created Adam. Was he a man? When God finished with his creation, was Adam a man? Yeah. He was what God wanted him to be, what God made him to be. God made him, and God made him to be a man. Jesus Christ, God entered and wonderfully worked in another way and working in Mary and he overshadowed her and his power caused her to conceive a son and bring forth that son. And he said, now that's my son. But was he a man? Yeah, that's what God created in Mary, a human son who would redeem the rest of us. Amazing. So Jesus did go forward and he did indeed then obey God and he followed the will of his Father and he accomplished what the first fellow that God had made had messed up. He undid it and that was he went forward and he kept himself pure before God and he kept himself clean before God. Impossible, he couldn't do it and be a man. This is quite untrue. It's God who gave to him the great favor and blessings that he, Jesus, would accomplish the things he did. And so I love this, this statement by Jesus. He says, I can do nothing on my own. I can do nothing on my own. 
I can't even judge. I can't, I can't even set forth words and judgments. No, as I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek to do not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. I can't do anything. Remember we read in John the 12th chapter in verses 49 and 50 where that Jesus said, My word, my teachings, they're not mine. They're His, my Father's. The one who commissioned me to bring this to you people. He's the one. He taught me. He taught me what to say. And he said, whatever he's taught me, that's exactly what I teach. John 12 and 50. So how could Jesus be sinless? God could work and move in him to accomplish what God wanted him to accomplish for the sake of the rest of us. Sure. And he did. Jesus did everything he did by the power of God, nothing by his own power, including triumphing over sin. So he does become our real, our true example. How will you have any hope of of overcoming or, or triumphing over sin? Through Jesus Christ, but also in our lives as we go about our daily lives. The reason we don't live in the sway of sin every moment and every day of our lives is because we too are like him to depend on God. He said, I don't think anybody else has overcome sin. I know somebody that did probably longer than Jesus. Who? Adam. How long do you think Adam lived before he fell? I figure it was a while. I don't know. So perhaps somebody's figured that out, but I don't know exactly how long he lived. But he could have lived a long time. He lived a long time after he sinned. If Adam lived a year, he lived a year without sinning. If he lived 10 years, he lived 10 years without sinning. If he lived 100 years, he lived 100 years without sinning. Jesus did it for 30-something years by the grace of God that was upon him. Why did God give to him this wonderful and unique grace? It was God's blessing working for the rest of us. Did he have to be an angel man to do that? Did he have to be a God man? God forbid. He had to be one of us. It was us that had to overcome sin. It's us that had to make this amend for sin. And it's God that was working to bring this about. So then it is not only by his death, but also remarkably by his life. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 10 and 11. And I think we forget this. We get so directed, and and rightfully so, to the death of Jesus Christ. And it's spectacular. That is, I think, his ultimate act of obedience. But we really lose sight of the fact that actually there's more to our relationship in hope and salvation in Him, and it's because of His life. Listen to Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 10. For if while we were enemies, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more surely having been reconciled, will we be saved by what? His life, the fact that He lives. How many of you know that had God not raised Jesus Christ up from the dead, we would have no hope of this life that we're talking about today? I really believe that with all of my heart. So it's by his life, Romans 6 and 10. Paul says the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. He's not dying again, and this is done. It stands good for all and for all time. But notice this, but the life he lives, not the one he lived, but the one he lives, he now lives to God. Not as God, he lives this life to God that he lives right now. Yeah, and for us. Listen to what God has done for us in Christ Jesus according to this gospel I'm preaching. Do you think this gospel would save a man? In Acts the 10th chapter, verse 38 and 40, remember Peter is the household of Cornelius and he begins to bring up, and here's by the way where we find out where God anointed Jesus. He's talking about it. He said to Cornelius, you know how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit God's Spirit and God's power anointed Jesus. It came upon Him and rested upon Him. And this was mighty. He anointed Him with the Holy Spirit and with power. And how He, Jesus, then went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because He was God. Oh my, no, wait a minute. Because God was with Him. So you see why I said before, Jesus did nothing of His own power. If he overcame sin and he didn't sin, I guarantee you it's because the, he depended on the power and the work of God to accomplish this. 
Wow. So he goes on to say, we are witnesses to all he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and allowing him to appear to the people, not to everybody, but to those of us who were chosen as witnesses. Now, I want you to notice this. In our theology today, and I understand this because this was my view at one time, we take the view that Jesus himself raised himself from the dead. I mean, after all, if he is God, then he doesn't need somebody else to raise him from the dead. But actually, the scriptures give you a different picture. The picture in the scriptures is a very different one. It's the picture we just read. God raised him on the third day. This is essential. Romans 10 and 9, many of you could quote it. Romans 10 and 9, that when Paul is talking about salvation and grace, listen to how he says it. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that he raised himself from the dead. Oh, no, wait a minute, I'm sorry. No. And you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Did you realize that this faith about Jesus raising from the dead, according to Paul, is predicated on the essential that you must believe God did it? How backwards can we make anything? How, how backwards can we ever put things that we say, oh yeah, no, he did that himself, of course. No, he didn't. And that's confounding to people who feel like that he is a God-man and all that sort of thing. But here we are, and the message of hope and salvation that one must embrace and believe in their heart is this, that God raised him from the dead. A very odd thing for much of us today. It just seems like he would have come busting out of the grave when he got ready. No, no. Here's what I believe. I believe this with all of my heart. If God had not raised Jesus from the dead, I believe he would still be dead today because he really was one of us. It was for real. It was for real. God raised him from the dead because without God raising him from the dead, he couldn't come out of that any more than you or I or anyone else could. Otherwise, it wasn't real. It wasn't one of us. God made him, God <laughs> made him our leader. In Ephesians 1, 17 through 22, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ This is Paul talking to the Ephesians, and of course, Jesus is now in heaven. But notice this. He said, I pray that the God of our Lord, Jesus Christ. Did you know that Jesus Christ has a God right now? Right now. The God of our Lord, Jesus Christ. He is the Father of glory. May give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know Him. And that's what we're talking about today. Can we come to know God? Yes, indeed. Can we have fellowship with God? We can, but by this new plan, God had to work out a plan whereby mankind could be reconciled. And this was God's work to do it. He accepted what one of, one of us did for all the rest of us. Just as he accepted what Adam did against us, God could decide that he would accept what one of us did for the rest of us. So with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. And that's the hope I'm speaking of today, my hope. My hope is in Jesus Christ, my Lord, who trusted in God with all of his heart and let God work a wonderful work in him for us. That's my hope today. Wow. What is the hope to which he has called you? What are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints? Verse 19, what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great power? Notice this power he's talking about there. He says, God put this power to work in Christ when he first raised him from the dead. My point again, Jesus came up from the dead, but I guarantee you it's because the power of God called him forward, not because of anything in himself. This mighty power of God, he put that to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And then God further seated him in his right hand in the heavenly places. Jesus Christ would not have been taken up into heaven unless God had taken him up. When he got there, God told him where to sit. Sit here at my right hand while we work on the rest of this matter. 
And God put him far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And God put him above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he did what? And he has put all things under his feet and has made him head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all in this body by the Spirit of God. Hence, God has exalted him. Acts, the second chapter, verse 36. This verse, by the way, folks, is one of the verses that got me thinking on this entire matter some years ago. It was a very important verse. Therefore, Peter says to the people on the day of Pentecost, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, with absolute certainty, that God has made that same Jesus, whom you've crucified, God has made him both, that means two things, God has made him Lord, and God has made him Christ. Think about this, folks. God made him Lord. God made him Christ. God raised him from the dead to begin with. Let me ask you a question. I said, if God hadn't raised him, I believe he'd still be dead. If God had not made Jesus Lord, do you think he'd be Lord anyway? If God had not made Jesus the Christ, if God had not anointed him to make him Christ, anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power to make him Christ, anointed, would Jesus have been Christ? No. God did these things. And guess who gets robbed of the glory when we decide that Jesus was already all these things to begin with? The God who did these things gets robbed of the glory. Because this was His pleasure. This is the glory of God that He's working in these things. This is His Son whom He loved. This is His Son whom He empowered to become a prince and a savior to the rest of us. So now we're talking about that God made him Lord and God made him Christ. But no, no, he said he was all that in the beginning and got out of that grave when he got ready. No, you're robbing God of his glory. And I'll tell you what else. The very last person who would ever want you to do that is Jesus Christ. He loved his father with all of his heart. He said, I do nothing of myself. And now we have developed over the centuries a contrary idea that he did everything of himself. Oh, my, he was powerful, he was mighty, he was God, he was God of the universe. This was not so. He was one of us. There is the thought now, oh, my gracious, he had to be God in order to purchase our salvation. He had to be God. I'm telling you right now, there's not one verse in all the Bible I've searched for a long time. Because it's important to me. There's not one verse in the Bible that said he had to be God to purchase our salvation. But I've been reading to you verses today that said he had to be a man in order to purchase our salvation. This is an amazing thing. He is our help. Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 24. Now, remember this life he lives to God? That life he lives to God is for the rest of us human beings. But notice this. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 24. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by human hands, a mere copy of the true one, but he entered into heaven itself. Now to appear in the presence of who? God. To appear in the presence of God. And notice those last three words. Can you say them with me? On our behalf. The rest of us. He is our mediator. 1 Timothy, the second chapter, verse 5. For there is one God. Now we've got our one God. There's your one God. There is also one mediator between God and humankind. Christ Jesus, himself, human. You say, well, how can a human being be the mediator between God and man? If God decided that that's the way he wanted it, then that's the way it would be. Moses was a mediator between God and men, all the people of Israel. Why? Because God chose for him to be that mediator. God chose that his human son, Jesus Christ, would be the mediator between himself and mankind And God fixed it that way, and God empowered him to be that. And notice this. It's not that he's the mediator because while he was here on earth, he did something. Oh, that was wonderful. That was essential. But he right now, there is one God. There is also, present tense, one mediator between God and humankind, the man Christ Jesus. And all of this is for all of us. Hebrews, the 6th chapter, 20th verse, where Jesus talking about into the presence of God, where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered. We have a forerunner, one who went first, one who went ahead of us. He has entered, having become a high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. 
We have a forerunner who's gone into the presence of God for us. What does all of this mean to us? Acts the 17th chapter verses 30 through 31. Paul is speaking at Athens and he tells the Athenians, and the times of this ignorance, times gone by, times past, while the, the Gentiles went their way and did as they would. Those times of ignorance, God winked at. He kind of closed his eye and let them go. But now, with the proclaiming of this gospel, now he commands all men everywhere to repent, to change, give it all up, quit serving Artemis of the Ephesians. Quit serving the false gods and quit serving all of these things of this world. Because He, God, has appointed a day in the which He, God, will judge the world in righteousness. But notice something. By that man whom He has ordained, God has ordained this man to this purpose. Whereof He has given assurance unto all men and that He, God, has raised Him, that man, from the dead. Here's the deal, folks. You have assurance of a resurrection from the dead. I have assurance of a resurrection from the dead because Jesus was one of us. Now, I'm not an angel person. If an angel person rose from the dead, that would be no assurance to me because I'm a man, a real, honest-to-goodness man. If indeed a God-man had raised from the dead, much less busting out his own self when he got ready. No, no, forget all of this. If a God-man had been raised from the dead, that's still not assurance to me because I'm just a man. It wasn't an angel-man that was raised from the dead. It wasn't a God-man that was raised from the dead. It was Jesus Christ, our Lord, God's Son, one of us. And that gives you assurance. That gives you certain assurance. God raises human beings from the dead. He raised him from the dead. Listen then and think with me for just a moment. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verses 20 and down along 23. Listen to Paul talking to the Corinthians and he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Notice again, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have died. In this resurrection, he's the first. For since death came through a human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. You were in Adam, which we all were, you die. That's the way it works because of what Adam did, actually. Now, if we come to be in Christ, all who will be in Christ will be made alive. There it is again. For all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. But each in his own order, Christ, the first fruits of this resurrection, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Folks, then, why are we here? And what do you think of the gospel that I'm preaching? And do you think it would save a man? Do you think this would bring you to eternal life? I could be preaching anything I want to. It's not incumbent upon me according to some organizational structure. It's not incumbent upon me according to some traditional program or or system, or anything else. I could preach anything I want. It's a free country, as we're saying. It's a great day to be alive. I'm preaching what I love. And I'm going to tell you right now, the day and the time of these errors, it's going to come down. It cannot stand. The truth of God is shining, and it's going to shine brighter and brighter and brighter. We must quit taking away God's glory and what He has done through His Son, Jesus. And we must quit besmirching and taking away from the honor of Jesus Christ by making Him into something that He's not. Why are we here then? 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 9. God is faithful. By Him, that is by God, you were called into the fellowship of somebody. You were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Who did it? God called us into the fellowship of our Lord. Wow. Back to fellowship. Remember I said that this whole matter, why are we here? It was about this whole question of fellowship with God. But notice, God's working it out. But how He's working it out? He's working it out with a human being, one of us. God is so smart. Aren't you proud of Him? 
He figured out how to stay righteous himself and still make a way for us to make amends. 1 John, the first chapter, verses 3 through maybe 7. Listen to this. John says, We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have fellowship with us. John meaning himself and, and the other brothers and sisters back there. And he said, And truly our fellowship is with, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, the anointed Jesus. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. We're writing these things so that we can take great joy in you and and we want you to be joyful. This is the message we've heard from Him and we're proclaiming it to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, that is with God, while we're walking in darkness, we lie and we're not doing what's true. But verse 7, one of my favorite verses and a guiding verse through my life. But if we walk in the light, as He, that is God, Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And this amazing promise, and the blood of Jesus His Son, cleanses us from all sin. The problem of sin, the problem that began with Adam, is now taken away by Jesus Christ, our Lord, God's true Son. Fellowship with our Creator really is restored. And now, guess what? It's restored in communion with our Lord Jesus. Jesus. 